Hello everyone, if you can already see me, we're just checking that the live stream is really live. I think we are, so welcome back to Meet the Germans Live, to our second live session, uh, and welcome to all the people who are here for the first time. Thank you very much for joining me on a Friday evening, I'm sure you've all got better stuff to do, but yeah, we're really glad to have you with us again. Um, I've got the chat window open, so I'm ready to take any of your questions if you've got them. Some of you have been really good and already sent some questions in uh, before on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, so I've got a few of those with me as well. Um, yeah, but I'm looking forward to meeting you all, so tell me where you're from in the comments when you write a question as well. Um, and yeah, we decided this time we would do a theme of summer and holidays, because next week I'm finally going off on my summer holidays, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. So if you don't see any Meet the Germans videos for a few weeks, you know why. But you can still get your daily fix of Meet the Germans if you like, because we've now got a DW Meet the Germans Instagram channel. So if you type into Instagram Meet the Germans, but it's DW underscore Meet the Germans, you'll find us. We've been live for about a week now. Um, and if you go and click on the first highlight that we've got saved there, you can get an introduction to the team. So it's not just me, there's a few of us going to be bringing you all sorts of content. Um, there'll be behind the scenes stuff from making the videos, of course. Uh, that's lots of uh, secrets we'll be telling you there. Uh, but there'll also be interviews and facts and lots of quizzes as well to test how much you actually know about Germany. Um, and really important for us is that we want to get more of your perspectives on there as well. So we want to get videos from you guys, we want to ask you questions, there's lots of interactions, so do come and join us there, we're looking forward to talking to you. Anyway, so yeah, summer topic we decided to go for. Um, I guess I'll start off with a question that someone's already sent in on YouTube. So we had John Riley from Canada. He said, he actually wrote in German, very good, <laughs> but I'll translate it. So he said, lots of people this year in, in Canada are going to be doing staycation, so staying at home for their holidays. Uh, is that the case in Germany? Yes. So because of the current situation, of course, probably more people than usual will be doing that. But something interesting about Germany is that um, a lot of Germans prefer to stay in Germany anyway. There's lots of domestic tourism. I think about um, a quarter or something like that I read of the population often will stay in Germany for their holidays. Uh, popular destinations, um, I think mecklenburg vorpommern in the northeast, that's very popular. They've got like the Baltic Sea coast, so that's a good draw. Uh, Bavaria is also really popular. Um, Nordrhein-Westfalen, where I live, is also pretty popular with Germans. Um, and they have a great word, which I learned a few years ago, Balkonian. So if you're having a staycation and really staying at home, people will say, I'm going to do my holiday on Balkonian, which is a bit like saying balcony land. So it means you're just going to stay in your balcony and have a little holiday there. I really like that. I thought that was cute. <laughs> um, yeah, where else in Germany? I think I was really uh, interested to hear that there were islands in Germany. I didn't even realise that before I came here. Um, but they've got their own little strip of islands next to some of the Dutch islands. So, yeah, you can really get everything in Germany, from forests and mountains all the way to the beach. <laughs> so, hello to Lucas, thanks for joining us, and to Josh and Lindsay. So, tell us where you are as well, or someone from Braunschweig. And Colombia, great. <laughs> nice to see you all. I don't know what time it is where everybody else is, so I'm sorry if this is a very inconvenient time for some of you. <laughs> but we have to find a balance somewhere. Um, so I'll take, there's no more questions yet, then I'll do one more from YouTube. We had one from Rezor. <laughs> so he asked, or she asked, what's German, what's the German's most common holiday destination? So we already spoke about some domestic places where they like to go inside Germany, but um, one very classic holiday destination for the Germans is Mallorca, which is a Spanish island. Um, it's got its own nickname, so they call it Malle, and it's kind of got a bit of a reputation as the party destination. So lots of Germans who, in the past 30, 40 years, uh, have wanted to go for uh, a big party and lots of drinking, um, would often head to Mallorca on sort of cheap package holidays. Um, there's this particular beach area called Balaman, which is... Uh, very much the sort of hub of, of German drinking, or it was. They've actually tried to crack down on that recently, so the locals have said we don't want so much mass tourism and we certainly don't want so much boozy tourism. Uh, I found it so interesting about the Mallorca thing just because actually there's a British contingent on Mallorca as well. <laughs> so there's the, the Bay of Palma de Mallorca, and on the one side Magaluf is where all the drunken Brits are, and on the other side is where the Germans are, so I found that a uh, 
perhaps a, a negative parallel between <laughs> my home country and my adopted country. But um, there's so much more to do on Mallorca. It's a beautiful island. I have been there. Uh, there's lots of sort of adventure sports that you can do there, and it's it's a really beautiful place. So not not just for drinking. <laughs> and one more place the Germans love to go is is Holland to the beaches. That's a very popular destination as well. So hello to everyone. So we've got someone from Los Angeles. Hi, Michael. We've got Japan. Oh, great. We haven't had someone from Japan before, I don't think, on the lives. Uh, Denver, Colorado. Great to see you all. Oh, and thank you, Josh. So Josh Sonny from Mumbai is saying he liked the castle video. So that was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I got to go to Ed's castle, which was really beautiful. Um, we met the Count as well, and he was really welcoming. And yeah, you can see the interview with him in the video. So that was really good. And a great holiday destination for people who uh, are thinking of where to go within Germany. So um, don't ask me any car questions because <laughs> I don't know anything about cars. It's not my, not my big subject. <laughs> so also let me know if you guys have been to Germany before and if you've done, if you've been, done holidays here before. So tell us what you like and what you didn't like about it. Lots of things on offer. Um, I'll go for one more question from YouTube. Something else holiday themed. As you can see behind me, I've tried to get some of my holiday gear out <laughs> for you guys. So I'll stick to the summer theme for a little bit. Uh, we had a question from Tim. So this is quite a good summer themed question. How do barbecue habits in Germany differ from those in the UK? Um, yeah, I'd say the obsession with the meat is very, <laughs> very noticeable here. So in the UK, of course, you grill meat, but I feel like there's a bit more, you know, veggie kebabs will always be there, lots of salads, that kind of thing. And in Germany, the focus is still very much on the meat. Sometimes when I leave a German barbecue, I cannot move because I've eaten way too much. Um, there's also the seriousness of the way you talk about the barbecue itself. So I reckon most Germans can talk with a lot of confidence about the positive attributes of a particular type of grill. Is it gas or is it coal? Um, is it efficient? Uh, which brand do you have? And they're usually quite expensive. <laughs> People will invest in a barbecue because it's very important. Uh, yeah, so I say those are probably the main differences. One time I did go to a barbecue and I made myself a roll, a crisp sandwich I like to call it, so the, what the Americans would call chips, in a bun and it horrified all the Germans that I was there with. So, <laughs> Okay, I've got a few more questions coming in. Um, oh, interesting actually, someone's saying they don't see many women in Germany wearing frocks and skirts, uh, mainly jeans and t-shirts. Yeah, I think that's definitely noticeable here that um, the main apparel for everybody, men or women, is, is casual and lots of jeans, lots of t-shirts. I think I noticed that mostly in the workplace, that um, I dress up a lot less now that I'm in Germany just because that's the normal thing to do here. <laughs> Makes you more comfortable, I can tell you that as a woman. <laughs> Uh, so we've got someone else from Canada, also learning German, very good, they are good, um, asking about <laughs> housing and rent prices. Um, I find that a really interesting question because in most countries the capital city is crazily more expensive than everywhere else and that for a long time hasn't been the case here, so Berlin has actually been notoriously cheap compared to the rest of the country, but the prices there have been going much, much faster in the last few years and the sort of the rate of inflation there is crazy, so um, I think it's going to be catching up with, if not overtaking the other places soon enough. <laughs> uh, but I think Munich's still the most expensive place to live. Um, so we've got somebody from Latin America <laughs> saying, "I loved that everything works in Germany as it's supposed to, which they're not 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 used to back home." That's largely the case. I think uh, everybody tries their best here to stick to the rules, and a lot of things function very well. But not always. I mean, I've mentioned before um, that I'm not a huge fan of the train system here. That doesn't always run on time. Um, and there are other hurdles to cross, like bureaucracy is often a big problem. Uh, but in general, I think the Germans are quite good at keeping things ticking as they're supposed to. Um, oh, I'm saying a fellow expat, pretty purple pokal dots, great name. Um, does it look like I'm going to be able to go home soon? Well, uh, the UK is on the list of countries we're allowed to go to, I believe, uh, that the EU published this week. So I think technically I would be able to go back. Um, the UK has been having a bit more of a strict lockdown situation still in the last few weeks, so I haven't planned a trip yet, but I really hope by the end of the year, maybe for Christmas, I can go home. <laughs> 
Ah, so Grey Rainbow asks whether Germans have a natural inclination for philosophy, which I saw earlier on YouTube as well, actually, that you asked. Very interesting question. I'm not sure if I would say philosophy. I'd say they have maybe a natural inclination for analysis. <laughs> um, they're very curious and they want to einordnen everything, which means sort of organise everything. Uh, sometimes that can veer off into the negative side of, of having a tendency to put everything in a box, um, which can be a bit of a rigid way of thinking. Uh, but also, yeah, I think it helps the analytical side of things. I think that's why they do it. They just like to, they like to understand everything. So, not sure about philosophy, but, but maybe a lot of them. <laughs> so, Oli's Amiga says, uh, what are my thoughts on Brexit and how can we bring the UK back into the EU? I'm not holding out too much hope that that's going to happen, sadly. My opinion on it is that I think it's a great shame that, that we left, but um, I guess now both sides have to try and make the best of it. So, we'll see what actually happens when finally something's actually changed. <laughs> Might take a while. <laughs> Thank you. Your videos make me love Germany more and more. I'm glad to hear it. I hope that I'm, I'm showing both sides of, of Germany in, in the videos, the challenges, but also the stuff that I love about the country and the reasons that I'm here, basically, and why, why it is my adopted home country. <laughs> Lots of love from India. Thank you so much. Uh, someone's asking if I fear catching the coronavirus. Nope, not particularly. I think um, I've actually been quite pleased with how Germany's dealt with the situation. Obviously, there have been uh, some exceptions. We've had recent problems uh, with, for example, um, the conditions for workers in meat processing factories and how, you know, it's highlighted, the coronavirus has actually highlighted problems in other industrial areas. So, yeah, we've had our own problems too, that's for sure. But, um, no, I feel quite safe, I must say, in Germany. So, what other questions have we got here? Hello to Brazil. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Someone asking if I go 170 on the Autobahn. So, as I said, I'm not a car person really, but I have driven on the Autobahn. I was pretty terrified because, yeah, people do go very fast and I'm not a very confident driver anyway. Uh, but you have, I have to tell you that the, the reputation of driving very fast on the Autobahn is often not possible because there are so many roadworks in Germany. <laughs> so often you'll find yourselves driving very slowly on a very narrow lane. Uh, which makes me even more nervous because I don't like don't like the narrow lanes. So uh, good luck if you do make it onto the autobahn, and um, I hope you get the chance to drive a little bit faster. <laughs> How much? Oh, where did that one go? I can't tell you how much English engineers use, but um, I can certainly say that in a lot of sectors over here. Uh, English is becoming more important, that's for sure. There's a lot of companies where um, English might be the main language, or at least it's the sort of common business language. Um, I guess that's the case in a lot of European countries and all over the world, really. I'm grateful that I get to use a lot of German in my workplace. Uh, I think someone asked earlier, actually, on, on Facebook about if I ever slip back into using English. I definitely do. I use a lot of English. Um, kind of depends who I'm with. And I definitely use a lot of Denglish as well, so if I can't find a word in German, I'll just, I'll just throw in the English word and most people will understand it. Uh, I quite like Denglish as a compromise language. <laughs> Hello to Bangladesh. <laughs> What's the most stupid rule in Germany? Oh, there are a few. <laughs> um, so I did do a video on, on weird things that, that Germany has banned. Um, Okay, I'm going to say my my least favourite is probably the one about not dancing on Good Friday. So, I understand it's got its religious background and everything, but I didn't know about it, and some of my friends came over to visit me at, during Easter holidays, yeah, I think it was a couple of years ago, and I didn't know about it, and they came just for the weekend, and they arrived, and we wanted to go out to a bar and, and have some drinks and have a dance, and uh, it wasn't possible, because <laughs> the bars that were open, uh, they couldn't play music, so what's the atmosphere then? Um, yeah, so that's a strange rule. It's not the case in every state, and the rules differ, you know, about the times, about banning dancing or music, or even live sports events. There's lots of bands on that day. I find that quite strange. And, of course, the classic... Don't cross the road on a red man. I don't like that one either. I think it's good to have rules, but I think you also should be able to use your intuition, <laughs> your common sense. 
So, someone asking about the most popular pop singer in Germany. I mean, I guess we probably have to say Helena Fischer. So she's the queen of Schlager, which is a quite a sort of specific German type of pop, which I guess, I guess it gets put into the box of trashy quite often, but it can be really fun. <laughs> so if you're in a bad mood and you put on, um, go onto Spotify or something and type in Schlager pop, hot, hot hits or something, um, yeah, it can really put you in quite a good mood to dance around. And yeah, I like Helena Fischer too. So, And she's very, very popular. And um, I think she even made it into the Forbes most wealthy list a couple of years ago. So yeah, she's doing well. Ooh, someone asking, KWNG asking, is touring Germany by campervan advisable? Yes, definitely. And if you do decide to do that, you will be in very good company because people here love camping and they love camper vans. Um, something at the beginning I, I couldn't really buy into because I thought if I'm going on holiday, I want to really be on holiday. You know, I want to relax. I want to have everything I need right there. I want someone else to cook for me. Um, I don't want to have to bring all my stuff with me. And the idea of a camper van where you basically bring some of your home <laughs> along with you on the road seemed quite a bizarre idea. And now I think about it, quite a German idea. <laughs> Very practical, quite efficient. Um, yeah, just having everything you need right there. But I have warmed to the idea and I am actually going to go in a camper van uh, probably next week. Um, we're not sure where we're, where we're going to go, but yeah, I'm going to have going to give it a go. A lot of my friends, especially in the younger generation recently, people are quite keen on, on building out their own vans. So they sort of try and do a bit of DIY and kit out an older van into a camping van. So yeah, the sort of, I guess the creativity of that and then the being independent in nature, it's, it's also quite in tune with the German psyche. <laughs> Ah, someone asking if Rammstein is bigger than Helena Fischer. I guess it depends which market you're talking about. I didn't say them because I'm not sure I would class them as pop. Um, but I mean, of course, Rammstein's huge. Uh, very, very, very popular band also internationally. So not my taste necessarily, but quite good for, um, for learning interesting German words because you have to listen very carefully to what they're saying to work out what the words are, so I think that's a good practice for German listening. <laughs> mm -hmm. How Germanized has your summer become? Um, I suppose if you're asking my summer habits, then I like to indulge in the stuff that the Germans like to indulge in here. I mean, I think the Germans love summer because they love being outside, they love, they love nature. Uh, and when the weather's a little bit better, obviously, we get the chance to do that here. Uh, it's great that as soon as the sun comes out here, you go to the parks and you see groups of people. Obviously, during Corona, it's uh, separate groups of people, but people are still very much trying to get outdoors. Um, it's very common to see people playing group games, so especially the kind of games that you... Uh, I think there's one called Vikinger Schach, so Viking chess. It originated in Scandinavia, but it's very popular here. Um, there's Flunky Bar, which is a great drinking game, which I actually played last week, uh, which also involves throwing and drinking beer. Uh, so there's those kind of park games that are really popular here. So obviously grilling is very, very popular and you're allowed to do that in, in certain parks here. Um, so yeah, I enjoy the, the aspects of a German summer. Ice cream, going to the ice cream cafe is a, a great, great habit in the summer as well. <laughs> Thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Thank you for telling me you like the show. I'm really, really glad. Um, do go to our Instagram channel and follow us there and you can see even more of that content as well. Looking forward to uh, seeing you on all the different channels. I like to talk to people on Twitter and then I see, I've seen some of them on, on YouTube now as well. So thanks for joining us everywhere. <laughs> Someone asking, are you going to have a vacation or a staycation? That's from Tox Timber. Um, maybe a bit of both. So we haven't actually decided yet, but as I said last time, I haven't seen enough of Germany yet. So I think it's a good opportunity now to um, try and just see a little bit more. I'm going to start off in Berlin next week, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. I haven't been there since January, so uh, that feels like a long time. Going to see some friends there and then, yeah, see, see, where, um, see where the summer takes us, basically. I've got a few weeks off, so um, I hope that I'll be able to get to a few different destinations. So, Ruben is asking, what do you think is the reputation of Germans when they're abroad or on holiday? Interesting. 
Uh, I think you probably have different groups of Germans. So I know that there's, there is a classic image of Germans going on a uh, package holiday. <laughs> um, maybe they have a less positive reputation, uh, but that's probably the same case for people from different countries as well. My own personal experience is, first of all, that Germans really are everywhere. So even when I've been to more sort of far-flung places, you almost always come across a German. Germans and Dutch, I think you find everywhere. Um, and personally, I've always found them to be good, good tourists. I mean, they're very curious. They want to see everything. I guess it's probably typical that they'll have a plan. <laughs> so they'll have researched everything beforehand and made notes, and they'll definitely have a guidebook with them to make sure that they... They get to see all the best aspects, uh, maybe less spontaneous than other tourists, but that might mean that they see everything and the rest of us don't. <laughs> Thank you all. Hello to Turkey. Uh huh. How do you guys take uh, documentary coverage during this COVID like traveling? I guess if you're asking about, um, about filming and how we can do coverage as journalists, uh, it's been a bit challenging. I mean, specifically for us, it was a bit challenging at the beginning. So I had the one episode where I filmed everything myself, and that was de definitely challenging. But uh, slowly, as the rules became a little bit more lax, we were able to um, go out in small teams, um, just make sure that we had our masks with us for when we were in public places, that kind of thing. Uh, and we actually were able to take advantage of the situation in some ways, because, for example, the cinemas were closed. So we went to a cinema and we had the whole place to ourselves. Uh, that was really cool. Um, yeah, so I think making the best out of a bad situation has been how it's been. <laughs> so I wanted to bring a, a cocktail with me for my summer theme, but I'm just sticking to the water because technically I'm still working, so. <laughs> I hope you guys have got a more exciting drink with you. <laughs> so, hello, guten tag. Thank you to Schreich Robin. Lots of people... Ah, someone asking, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Politics, question <laughs> mark. Uh, or, or the boss of DW Euromax. Well, I'm not sure. I haven't really thought that far ahead. I'm not really um, into planning very far. Definitely not politics. That's not my cup of tea. <laughs> but I hope I'm still in Germany and I hope I'm still being surprised by the things that the Germans do and the things I see here. <laughs> Any more questions? Put them in the comments. <laughs> and Christine is saying, greetings from Spain. Uh, I see you have sunscreen on the back. I do have sunscreen on the back, I have Scottish skin and it's very necessary, that's factor 50 <laughs> uh, and I very much need it, so yes, I take my sun cream everywhere. And the weather's really good in Germany right now, so even if I stay in Germany and do a staycation, it's possible that I will need it. Okay, I'm going to take one more question that we had earlier. So Alejandro said, talking about beaches and taking sun in parks, what's your experience with naturalism and nudism in Germany? <laughs> um, I've never actually been to a nudist park, not that I was aware of, uh, but I, I don't think I would have a problem with it. I think, it's, I think it's about context and it's exactly the same as with a sauna. So when I arrived, going to the sauna was a really, really strange cultural experience for me. But because everyone else is in exactly the same situation, Everyone else is nude. Nobody's making a big deal out of it. Uh, it's quite normal. So I guess in a park it would be the same thing. It might be strange the first time you do it, but I mean, no one's looking at you because everybody's in the same boat. So why not? Do you think that as a non-native speaker, you would ever be able to feel really at home in Germany? Yes, definitely. Um, I already feel very at home in Germany. I think it has a lot to do with different factors. I think having your own life, so your friends and work, is really, really important. I would say um, getting to grips with the language is really important as well, just mainly from, from making you feel more confident and making you feel that you can get your own point across. I think that's the most frustrating thing at the beginning is when you are following a conversation, but you're not quite fast enough in the language to be able to, to get your point across. Um, or to make a joke or something that comes into your head but you're not quite fast enough, that's the most frustrating. And I think when you get over that barrier, that's when you can really start to feel at ease and your personality is coming across and that's when you start to feel more at home, I think. So, yeah, definitely, it's absolutely possible to feel at, at home here as, as a previous outsider. And um, as I've said before, I, I find the Germans to be very welcoming. Hello to the Philippines, thank you for joining. 
got people from South America, North America, Turkey. Oh, what's your impression on Swiss German or any German dialects? So I find dialects quite difficult still, but Swiss German, interestingly enough, um, I find not too difficult. I think maybe because it's a bit more lilting. I'm not really sure why. But uh, in general, dialects I find quite difficult, but just simply because I'm not exposed to them often enough. So I, I mostly know the Cologne area where I live. And uh, when, I, when I hear other accents on the television or something like that, it's very noticeable that it sounds different to me. So I probably need to practice that a bit more. <laughs> we had an interesting question actually before about accents or specifically about the borders of Germany. So Germany borders nine countries, which is quite crazy when you think about it. I grew up on an island, so <laughs> the idea of just being able to drive over or even walk over into lots of different countries seems quite exciting to me. Um, so, if I find that question, that was from Rara, and they said, I'm curious to know what's it like living at the borders of Germany to another country? Does the language suddenly change when you cross the border? So the official language will usually change in most cases, but yeah, you'll definitely get dialects that are kind of a mishmash between the two. So if you think maybe in the Alsace region, so where Germany borders France, you've got the, the Alsatian dialect, and that's a mixture of sort of Southern German and French, um, which is quite cool, really. It sort of, I suppose it makes a sort of bonding ground <laughs> on, the, on the border between the two countries. It's a place, you know, Strasbourg, for example, was sort of switched over between Germany and France anyway in history, um, and that's a kind of hangover from it. The sad thing is that just like in most places in the world, the regional dialects are getting less and less, so fewer people speak them, um, but you'll certainly hear them along the border towns at the moment. I'm actually going to Strasbourg this weekend, so um, yeah, I'll let you know if I, if I hear some Alsatian. <laughs> okay, so... Tuba's asking, what do you miss most from your hometown? Can be food or a habit? Hmm. Obviously my friends, that's the, the most important thing. But what else do I miss? Do you know what? I'm going to be really cliched and say that I miss a really good cup of tea. I just think it tastes different here. So I think there's something about the milk that makes it taste different. And also just the, the ritualistic practice of it, it's true that when you go to someone's house in the UK, it is true that most people will say, do you want a cup of tea or do you want a cuppa? And it's a kind of welcoming ritual. And I miss that a little bit. I still here have the habit of saying, do you want a coffee or something? I try and substitute it, but it's not the same. <laughs> Actually, that reminds me of um, when I did a German exchange. So I think I was 13 years old and I went to the town of Dillenburg, which is not that far from Cologne where I live now. Uh, I stayed with a German family and I could speak basically no German. I think I could say about two sentences. And I didn't, I didn't at that point in my life, never seen Kräuter tea, so herbal tea. I'd never seen it before. And at the breakfast table, the family asked me if, if I'd like tea with my breakfast. And I thought, yes, great, because I normally had tea at home anyway. So I said, yes, please. And then they presented me with this very red looking tea. I was a bit suspicious, but I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed the milk poured some milk in it and started drinking it. They all looked horrified. By that point, when I realised this is definitely some kind of fruity tea and it probably shouldn't have milk in it, it was too late, so I had to just go with it. <laughs> but uh, not recommended. Fruit tea, don't put milk in it. Not good. <laughs> Ollie's asking, do I stop working every time at four o'clock in the afternoon to drink tea? Not anymore. Um, in the workplace in the UK, you, you stop every half an hour to make a cup of tea. That's uh, very important. Usually different people will take it in turns to make do a tea round. Um, but no, I think I drink a lot more coffee in Germany just because there's less tea. And it's interesting you say four o'clock. So in Germany there's a saying, kein Bier vor vier, which means no beer before four o'clock. <laughs> so yeah, while well, the Brits are drinking tea, the Germans are opening their first beer. <laughs> Thank you, Angel. I'm glad you liked the videos. If you guys have got your favourite video, let me know. I'd love to hear which ones are your, your top videos so far. <laughs> Someone asking, Americans versus Germans in USA football. 
I know very little about American football. I did go to an American football game while I was in Washington. It was very long. <laughs> um, and in Germany, you don't hear much about American football at all. Obviously, you hear a lot about football, football, soccer, football. Um, and yeah, it's been interesting recently because the Bundesliga was being played or is being played. No, it's over now, right? <laughs> uh, being played with no fans, which is quite strange. So it's the same case as a lot of sports across the world right now. Uh, but oh, they still managed to keep up a bit of hype about it. So they seem to have survived. Ah, and someone saying 24 B2 R saying they very much recommend Ostfriesische tea. I know, I need to try this. I haven't tried it yet. Um, so I've heard about it and it's slightly different, right? So you have, you put cream in it and you're not supposed to stir it, I've heard. So I, I know I need to try this and compare it to my British habits. Um, maybe this will be a very good alternative for me while I'm in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Someone seems to think my, my accent is becoming German. Well, there you go, I guess that happens. I definitely find that uh, I lose words sometimes in English. So I'm trying really hard to... I'm talking to somebody in English and I'm trying to find a word and only the German word will come. So that definitely happens when you're learning a language. <laughs> ah, Ruben's favourite videos. German laws, which we talked about already. Asparagus, very good. And healthcare. Oh yeah, very good. Yeah, the asparagus was probably probably my favourite one to make because that was the one where I made a poem and it was just fun. A bit silly but at the same time we packed loads of information into it so I enjoyed that. <laughs> um, so Claudia's asking, do you like the German habit of spending as much time as possible outside, not only in corona times? Yes, I love this habit. I think it's definitely one of the best things about being in Germany and about the German people as a culture, um, that they love nature and they love any opportunity to connect with it and be in it um, and I think they connect it to a sense of well-being which is definitely true I mean when you, you spend time outside you definitely feel a bit sort of you switch off from the normal life of, of digital stress and work and everything like that and I think the Germans have cottoned on to that very much so they love their hiking as I said they love their camping um, and they love simply being out in the park and barbecuing and yeah that's a really great habit that they have. Someone asking about popular sports after football. That's a really good point. Um, there are a lot. I mean, what I find interesting is handball, simply because we don't have that in the UK. So I had never had the chance to play it. That's pretty popular here. And it's a cool sport. Uh, they also are pretty good at hockey. So, yeah, they're quite into ice hockey as well, which I was quite surprised about. So what else? What else are the sports have we got? Yeah, I think those are probably the most important ones. Um... I like tennis a lot, and I like to say with my husband that um, the Brits are better at tennis, so at least we've got something over them. <laughs> Fish and chips and currywurst. Thank you very much to Strovit. <laughs> um, I'm hope guessing you're saying you like that, uh, the episode where I went back to London and did a little rap about fish and chips and currywurst. Incidentally, I still prefer fish and chips, but I'm happy to have the option of both. <laughs> Ah, biathlon, very true. That's another another sport that's um, very popular in Germany. Ah, someone wants me to say a few difficult German words. Well, you're going to have to tell me which words to try and say and I'll have a go. Uh, but the most difficult thing is if you're talking English already and then you suddenly say some German words. It's quite difficult because I, I don't know, I guess it's just the shape of them. Uh, your mouth is trained towards one or the other and then switching in mid-sentence can be quite hard, I'd say. <laughs> Oh, another person's got Fabio's also saying the asparagus episode is the favourite uh, and asking about the team behind making the videos. So thank you, I'm really glad that you enjoy them. Uh, we're a small team, we're usually just three of us when we go filming. So myself, a producer and a camera person. So um, we'll just have one day of filming and then we, I go into the cutting room and it takes a couple of days to cut. So yeah, very small team and we are... Yep, planning the next episodes already, so after the little summer break where I go on holiday, we've got lots more ideas already in the pipeline. Please do put more ideas for topics in, in the comments that you would like to see, because oh, we have our list is always growing and we're glad that we're not running out of ideas. Um, always ideas that we can also expand on Instagram now, so we could 
bring you a behind the scenes, we can give you a story, bring you some live stuff from there as well. So all sorts of possibilities now. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. Eichhörnchen. That's my trying to pronounce the word for squirrel, uh, which is notoriously difficult for non-Germans to speak it in German, to pronounce it in German, and for Germans to say the English equivalent squirrel is also notoriously difficult. So I guess that was a vocabulary that was put there to challenge us all. Which British snack or candy do I miss the most uh, in Germany? Classic has got to be Cadbury's chocolate, but the recipe's changed since I was younger, so it's not so good anymore. <laughs> um, and I've, I've said it before, but the, the range of crisp flavours that we have, it's, it's really brilliant in the UK. I miss, for example, um, prawn cocktail favourite crisps. Very good. But Germany has started bringing salt and vinegar crisps out now, so I'm, I'm sorted. Oh, I'm getting 9 out of 10 for my pronunciation of... I'm not going to say it again, <laughs> of squirrel. Thank you very much. I'm glad to hear it. So Karen's asking, what do you think about living as a family in Cologne? Is it family friendly? I would say uh, something I've noticed here is that cities in Germany seem really family friendly. I think it's quite normal for people to stay central in the city, even when they have a younger family. Um, a lot of people live in flats rather than houses, and that doesn't seem to be a big problem. And yeah, in general, you see lots of young families around here, especially where I live. <laughs> so I think it's a, a pretty family-friendly city. Um, there's a lot of parks and a lot of playgrounds in the parks. Uh, that's quite normal. Uh, I think having a green city is pretty important when you're, you're a family. So yeah, definitely. Someone asking if I've ever been to India. No, I haven't, but I would love to go. So you'll have to give me um, an exchange here. I'm giving you tips about Germany. You can give me tips about India. <laughs> When I'm able to travel again, hopefully I'll, I'll make it over there. Someone asking, will you ever teach German to students? Um, no, <laughs> I would never teach German, I don't think, because I didn't learn it in the academic sense, so I probably would teach people some bad grammar rules. <laughs> um, but I did actually teach English in Germany, so when I first came over here, I worked in a bar for a bit and I also worked in a language school. And that was really good for both ways, because I was teaching younger kids, and they were all German native speakers. So I actually learned from them while I was teaching. Back then, my German wasn't great. So, yeah, I think I learned quite a lot from them, and obviously I was able to um, teach them my, my native tongue a lot easier than I would be able to teach German. Okay, Abdul's asking for advice on dating a German girl. Okay, I would say... I would say German... Women are quite forward-thinking, so treat them with respect, but there's no need for um, any outdated ideas on chivalry. I think um, treating treating women very much as equal is very important here because they, they're quite uh, up-to-date with, <laughs> with their roles on that kind of thing. So, um, And it's also completely normal for the girl to ask the guy out here, for example. So, yeah, that's probably my advice. Oh, someone's asking about cricket and rugby in Germany. Nope, I don't think that that is a thing. Um, no one, you haven't asked about netball, so I'm a netball player, which is a, a sport that we play in the UK and several other countries in the world, but not Germany. Um, and I've started a team here in Germany, so maybe netball will be <laughs> the upcoming German sport. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and so Astro is asking about Verein clubs and socialising with Germans. So yeah, the idea of the Verein sort of... Um, an organisation is very important here. Everything's, as typically German, is very official and organised. So uh, if you have a sports club, you're officially registered and you're part of the Verein. Um, that's quite a big part of German culture, I'd say, and it's a really good way to meet Germans and to get practising your German. So uh, whatever your hobby is, it doesn't have to be sport. Uh, that's a really good way just to sort of get in with a group of people who all have a common hobby. So yeah, that's a really good idea. And Sid is saying I must try um, tea from Kerala and Darjeeling. Obviously, I've had Darjeeling tea. Very good. Thank you very much for the tip. Namaste. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, well, I hope I do make it over. Thank you, Paul Kit. And... Oh, someone's asking, so... Can you recount a relatively embarrassing experience with the German language? I'd say I've had many. <laughs> Maybe I've blocked some of them out. 
Um, I think some that spring to mind are the really simple mistakes that I was making early on, and nobody corrected me. So I carried on making the same simple mistakes for a really long time. There were things like, I learned that in German, the J, which I would pronounce as J, in German is a J, like yogurt. Um, but it meant that I was then using that rule for words which actually came from English, and then they don't change the sound. So, for example, I would say that on the weekend I was going joggen, <laughs> if I was going jogging, and actually you just say joggen. Or I told people that I was a journalist instead of journalist, because I thought that's how you said it, and nobody corrected me for such a long time. Another one was that <laughs> when I met people for the first time, I would say angenehm which is really, really, really formal. It's like in English if I would go up to someone and say, um, uh, terribly pleased to meet you, sir. <laughs> and nobody corrected me, so I was walking around saying Anganim in really casual situations for a long time. So top tip for any Germans out there, if people are saying things like that, please correct them because they will appreciate the help. <laughs> Jar Jar Binks, great name, is saying they can't find white asparagus in the UK. I don't think it exists there. Maybe at very specialist markets or something, but no, I'd never seen it before I came here. Uh, so I don't know if it exists. Just to put your mind at ease, I'm telling you, uh, green asparagus is better anyway. Don't tell the Germans. <laughs> Gabriel's asking, what's Oktoberfest about? I guess you know what it's about. It's <laughs> largely about drinking beer, but also about celebrating. Um, and dancing and having a great time. Uh, not going to be on this year, but uh, if you follow DW, you're going to find lots of great uh, clips from last year and things like that as well. So we'll bring you the Oktoberfest spirit, don't worry. Josh is asking, do I think I've ever been a German in my past life? No, <laughs> definitely not. I think even now I still very much notice uh, the differences between the way I approach things and the way that most German people approach things. Um, I think that I, as I said, I'm quite settled here, so I, yeah, I think I've got used to things, but no, I don't think that I was previously a German. <laughs> Have I ever fallen for typical false friends like gift? Yes, definitely. Um, I think they're there to trick you very much. I think whoever made up these false friends is very cool. Um, I can't think of any good examples right now, but... I mean, I guess the classic one, chef, chef, about whether it's a boss or whether it's a cook. Um, and I think common. that's a strange one. So when I worked in a bar in Germany, people would ask, um, can ich ein Aschenbecher bekommen? And I'd be thinking, hmm, they're saying, can I become an ashtray? And it, I didn't know that common meant, um, can, I, can I get, please, can you give me an ashtray? So just little things like that that you immediately think you must know what the word is, but it's a false friend, so watch out. Rohat's asking, thank you very much, saying that my German's good. Depends who's who's listening. <laughs> but asking how I feel about reading poems and novels in German. So, I don't read enough in German, that's for sure. I try and read the newspaper sometimes. I think poetry, it's a good idea. That's probably a good place to start because it's more emotive, um, less text. <laughs> so yeah, that's actually a really good idea, but no, that's something I'd like to look into more, and when I have succeeded in that, I will give you more tips. I'm afraid I haven't started following football particularly. Um, my husband, he's going to kill me for saying this, but he's a Bayern Munich fan. <laughs> so for a while I pretended I was also a fan, but then I realised I just don't like football very much. Uh, Giuseppe says that he's been pr pronouncing Nacht as Nacht <laughs> for months now and no one corrected him. So yes, I feel your pain. <laughs> um, I guess people are just a bit embarrassed and they don't want to correct you or, or make you feel bad. But no, the best practice is definitely to correct people in these situations. <laughs> oh dear, difficult. Okay, so let's have a look just quickly and see what else we had come in beforehand. Ah, yeah, there was one from Jakob, and he says, My girlfriend is moving from Oxford to Berlin this month. Any advice for soon-to-be expats? So, hmm, I suppose the most important piece of advice is definitely make German friends. 
might be more difficult in Berlin because obviously it's a very multicultural city. Uh, there'll be lots of other expats there as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's the most important thing whenever you move to a new country is to feel like you've got a circle of your own friendship there, a friendship circle. Um, also bring some home comforts with you. So never underestimate how great it can make you feel if you're having a down day and you're feeling some kind of um, cultural exclusion or you're just not, not feeling it that day. Uh, yeah, don't underestimate how great it can be to open the cupboard and see something, a little home comfort. So I have, obviously I have Marmite, that uh, very gloopy British uh, breakfast spread. <laughs> um, something simple like uh, sweets or whatever, Cadbury's chocolate as I mentioned earlier. I always bring dental floss back with me because I don't know why, but the German dental floss just doesn't do it for me. So yeah, and also last bit of advice, seeing as you're moving to Berlin, don't party too hard. It can be difficult. Uh, Michael Morgan, I think you're actually here, Michael. I think I saw you earlier, uh, asking if I took German in school and if it's been easier since I've been here. So I had German for a year in school, which is why I went on the German exchange, as I mentioned earlier. And I did actually enjoy it, but I can't say I learnt very much. Um, and then I forgot it all because that was back when I was 13 years old. And yeah, so it's a lot easier now that I'm here because it's simply the idea of, of putting it into practice, of learning something when you're actually there and you actually have to use it. Um, and also learning up-to-date modern language. I mean, I know, I remember one of the words that stuck in my mind from that time back at school was stinklangweilig, and you'd say, it sort of means deadly boring. <laughs> and you would sort of say, oh, I don't like maths class because it's stinklangweilig. And then we went on the German exchange and we said everything was stinklangweilig, and all the kids were like, that's not a term that you actually use. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's important to um, very much be learning the living language, as you say. Hello to Peru and more people from India and Mexico. Great to meet you. <laughs> Anna's asking what my experience has been in German hair salons. I think you can probably see I've got a bit of a corona cut right now and I need to go to the hairdresser. Uh, so I've got an appointment next week. I've always had good experiences, but I must say that's one of the situations where I feel a little under pressure because it's going to be small talk there. And as we all know, the, the German type of small talk is not maybe the same as elsewhere. And sometimes I worry that I'm not going not gonna to be able to keep up, you know, I'm not going to have the right topics. So far, it's been absolutely fine. Last year, um, we talked merrily about our weddings because we were both about to get married, so... Um, yeah, but it's definitely a good test of, of doing small talk with somebody going to the hair salon. Ah, so Paul is saying um, he's got Dutch friends and he finds that easier to understand than German. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I think actually Dutch is often seen as a sort of mixture, right? If you can speak German and you can speak English, um, then you can come a long way with Dutch. I don't speak Dutch, but when I go to Holland, I can definitely recognise a lot of the words because it's got the roots from both sides. Yeah, it's pretty cool how languages do that, right? Ah, we've got more people asking for German movie recommendations. So, hmm. I know it's a classic, but Run, Lola, Run. It's probably the first German movie I ever saw. Um, and that was cool. It's shot in quite like an arty way, which um, I don't know if you'd always associate with Germany necessarily. But yeah, I really like that film. It's an old, an old one, but a good one. <laughs> You're very welcome, Paul. Thanks for asking the question. Oh, someone asking if I'm going to start a podcast. I'm not sure I have time for that right now. <laughs> but I love listening to podcasts. And that is another great way to pick up language. I mean, even if you're not actively listening I think if you're going running or something or you're in the gym or you're doing a cooking and you put a podcast on of people talking German that can be really cool especially the ones where they're kind of chatting with each other which in German you might refer to as a laber podcast so lots of talking um, they can be really good because they're natural speech it's not sort of rehearsed speech and you can sort of feel like you're in on the conversation so yeah that's a really good way I think I've also been listening to more German music recently because uh, I think that's a great way of boosting your vocabulary without, again, without really thinking about it. And certain sentences will stick in your mind, 
and then you'll remember exactly how to say it when that context comes up. So I think that's quite good. Ooh, someone asking how many countries I've visited so far and which has been my favourite. Oh, I love travelling and the Germans love travelling too. I think that's definitely um, something you can say about the culture here. I would say possibly, no, definitely the favourite place I've ever been is Reunion Island, which is where I studied abroad. It was uh, just about four or five months and it was just great fun and it was really cool because it was the mixture of European culture and it's in the southern hemisphere it's sort of uh, right next to Madagascar and it's got influences from all over from Africa from China from India it's got different religions it's got Hinduism and, and Islam and Christianity all mixed together uh, on this tiny little island in the Indian Ocean and that's really really interesting and when I was there studying guess what there were lots of Germans there as well, <laughs> and that's where I met my German husband. So, yeah, I guess they enjoyed it there as well. Oh, and Olaf says Reunion is the best island for hiking. Very true, and that is probably the first place where I went on an enjoyable hike. So, I say enjoyable because hiking in my childhood was associated with pain. <laughs> um, we have this thing called the Duke of Edinburgh Award in the UK, where teenagers are sent off with with their school groups to to basically do an endurance test and have a massive heavy pack on and they're sent out into the Welsh mountains with just a compass and the driving rain and not a very romantic picture um, and I did that and that's what I always associated with hiking and then actually you go somewhere like Reunion and this is beautiful landscapes and you finally realise that hiking can be great and Obviously the Germans know that too. I mean, they love their hiking and that's a really popular holiday activity for them. So I guess they cottoned on to that a bit earlier than I did. <laughs> Someone asking, Utsab's asking um, if they can learn German online or through YouTube videos. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously when you're starting to learn a new language, you need the basis somewhere. So you need to find some kind of course that will, will give you that first foundation. And then from that point, you can use all sorts of resources. So you can, like we said, use podcasts and music and watching films with subtitles in your own language, but listening to the original speech. Or the other way around, you could watch videos that are made anywhere and put German subtitles on and you'll pick up little words here and there. I would recommend um, checking out DW Deutsch Lernen. Uh, they've got an Instagram as well, but they also have loads of resources on the DW website and they've got great stuff for all different levels of German learners. So yeah, check that out. Okay, Malta's asking, what's your favourite German football team? As I said earlier, my husband is a Bayern Munich supporter, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spread out a little bit and say my top three would be Bayern, Bremen and Schalke, just because I can name those right now. <laughs> so Fernando's asking, do you have a YouTube channel or are you planning on opening one? So all our videos are published on DW Euromax and so you'll be able to find them all there. You can check out the playlist and we've got a list of, I don't know, I think we've done like 32 now or something. So there's plenty there to watch. Uh, but don't forget to check out on Instagram as well. So we've got our own Meet the Germans Instagram account now. So if you like our content, come over there and, and follow us and leave us a comment. Let us know where you're from and let us know what you want to hear about. So we've got loads of opportunity there to, to talk about all sorts of topics in stories and longer videos in IGTV and stuff. So yeah, loads of opportunity there. Let us know what you want to hear. And that's DW underscore meet the Germans. <laughs> Harry says, my lecturer says the best thing to try in Germany is roasted pork knuckles. Whew, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those. <laughs> they are enormous. I think when you go to the breweries here, the the menu can be quite daunting because almost everything that you get you're not quite sure what it is when you get it it's sort of a nondescript big lump often lots of beige brown colors involved um obviously very meat heavy but yeah i have had it before and it is tasty it's just that it's big <laughs> so maybe maybe share it with somebody <laughs> Ah, so MT is asking, on a scale of 1 to 10, how important is German in Germany? Phew. I mean, that's a, a difficult question to interpret, but I, I'm going to say 9, because you can get away with, with not speaking German if you really, really want to, and if you're a tourist, absolutely, 
but um, speaking German or at least understanding some of it will unlock so much more of the culture. It will just mean that you can communicate better with people and I think a lot of Germans, even though they're actually really good at English in general, especially sort of my generation and younger, um, I think they're quite nervous about it sometimes and they will feel that they can't express themselves or show their personality. So as soon as you show the willingness to speak to them in German, um, even if it's not perfect, they won't care at all. I think that that can really, it can help to build up friendships, it can certainly break down barriers uh, and it'll make them feel more, feel more at ease. So yeah, I think both both ways, that works both ways. Um, Christina's asking, are Germans interested in a country or culture in particular? Like I said, I think Germans, they're really curious people and they travel a lot generally. So um, I'm not sure I'd say one in particular. Obviously, they spend a lot of time in Europe as well. As we said, they're sort of right in the middle and they've got borders with nine countries. So they've got the opportunity to go in any direction and discover a new culture. So within what a couple of hours or three hours, four hours, you can get to so many different countries, uh, regardless of where you are in Germany. So yeah, they definitely travel a lot and, and they enjoy exploring other cultures. And they enjoy speaking other languages too, yeah. So Jar Jar Binks is asking, it's a, it's a very good name, I can't get used to, <laughs> to saying that here. Um, are there any places in Germany where English is hardly known or spoken? I mean, I guess you could generalise and say that the further you are out of a big city, the more likely it is that, that you'll, you'll struggle more with English. But I'd say that what with social media and, you know, Hollywood films and all of that, Netflix, of course, um, I think gradually everywhere is picking up more and more English, especially the younger generations. So, yeah, but if you want to be challenged, then yes, go, go to the smallest village you can think of. And I'm sure, sure it'll be slightly different there. Okay, Ehrentraut is asking Berlin or Munich. If you're asking my personal opinion, then I'm going to have to say Berlin because I lived there for a little while. I've got lots of friends there. It's such a great city. Uh, it's great for relaxing and for partying. So, yeah, I really enjoy it. But, of course, Munich's beautiful. I've only been once, so I need to go back there and uh, try it out again. Maybe without Oktoberfest this time. <laughs> See what else it has to offer. Okay, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Kanisha is saying make another rap video. I will do my best. I definitely want to come back to that. I probably need to practice my rapping skills before I do that. Maybe I could do some kind of collaboration and mix in German rap, because that's very important here as well. So, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so Mark's saying people over 50 do not always understand English in the East. I think it's the case everywhere that um, the older generations are less likely simply because they haven't had the same exposure to it. But um, I find most people, even if, even if they can't speak it that well, are very keen to try. Okay, do you know which language Germans prefer to learn? I mean, they love, they love learning English. As I said, a lot of them like to go to Spain on holiday, so I'd say probably Spanish is up there as well, definitely. So they like to go to, to the Spanish islands, but also uh, the Canary Islands are really popular as well. So yeah, I'd say Spanish is probably, probably up there. <laughs> Gabrielle's saying pinka pinka, pinka pinka, <laughs> that's the word. Um, the slightly outdated term for money, which I used in, in the money episode. So I'm glad you all remember that. Okay, got time for one more question. Okay, yeah, so Fabio had asked earlier, what surprised you in a positive way when you moved to Germany regarding life in Germany? So I think that the Germans have a bit of a reputation for being, you know, not necessarily generous for sort of being a little bit stingy sometimes and I think that's a stereotype that German people themselves often say and they talk about themselves in that way and that's not been my experience at all so I have actually been positively surprised about how generous Germans are um, whether it's about you know sharing something with you or offering you help I think that yeah that's a really good trait that they have so yeah I guess uh, we've been on for an hour so I'm going to let you all go and enjoy the rest of your evenings now Thank you so, so, so much for being here. It's been really fun again, and we'll definitely have to do it again soon. If you've got a topic that you'd like us to maybe focus on next time, then um, let me know. 
I'm going to be using these things in the background very soon going on my holidays. So, um, yeah, but carry on leaving comments and uh, we'll be back in no time. As I said, do check out our new Instagram channel. We've put a link to that in the comments below. Uh, so it's DW underscore meet the Germans. And yeah, we're looking forward to seeing you there. Thanks very much. Bye.